Good morning, everybody. My name is Kara Masseri, and I am the Communications and Marketing Manager at the Northern Virginia Technology Council. Welcome to our webinar today. I can see that people are still logging in. Um, I, I have a brief introduction, and then we will um, launch into the presentation. I would like to take a few minutes to tell you about some upcoming events here at NVTC. We hope that you'll be able to join us this Wednesday at 4 p.m. for our second virtual happy hour. This one will feature technology trivia. So uh, we are planning to have a lot of fun and hope to see some of you there. On Thursday, we will host the fourth presentation in our business continuity webinar series. The presentation will focus on practical time management strategies for working from home, even with children. I myself have three children at home and I will definitely be listening closely to this webinar. We will finish the week on Friday with a virtual morning coffee at 9 a.m. Jennifer Cisliano, the Chief External Affairs and Communications Officer with Innova Health Systems will be our guest speaker. All of our NVTC events can be found on our website, which is www.nvtc.org. Today's presentation is titled, Leading Through the Coronavirus, Guidance for HR and Business Leaders. Our presenter and subject matter expert is Kim Mushlock. She is the principal consultant at Helios HR. She has over 20 years of progressive human resource experience and a diverse set of skills across multiple HR disciplines. A veteran of the armed services, armed forces, sorry, Kim began her leadership training early in her career and continues to develop her knowledge base today. We are excited to learn from Kim. If you would like to ask a question during the presentation, you can type it in using the Q&A Q feature, which you will find at the bottom of your screen. And lastly, this webinar is being recorded today and is the property of the Northern Virginia Technology Council. You may not distribute or use this content without written consent from NVTC. And with that, I will pass the presentation to Kim. Thank you. Hey, Kim, we can't hear you. Are you on mute? Ah, how is that? Much better, thank you. Oh, wonderful, thanks. Good old technology. Um, so this is me, I'm Kim Moshlock, as, uh, as Kara just said, um, I've been with Helios. I'm in my ninth year at Helios as a consultant. And uh, when I'm not consulting at Helios, I'm spending time with uh, those two folks on the right-hand side and several other corgis. Uh, in my home, so I kind of that's kind of how I keep myself occupied, and it's certainly been um, ha had a lot more quality time lately, as I'm sure all of you would agree. So let's just talk about probably the main theme today of what we're going to be talking about, and that is this: don't panic. Um, we're all in a situation where uh, I think we're all in this together. Is <clears throat> certainly been a hashtag we see a lot. <clears throat> we. Um, we, you know, it's the most important thing that we can do right now as leaders and organizations, you know, change is inevitable and we're certainly in a period of change right now. And technology is going to continue to evolve and our change is going to be inevitable as we move forward. Uh, this is unprecedented. There is no question about it. We all are going through something that we've never been through before. Uh, very uncharted waters. And so our goal here is to try to withstand the storm. And, and I think so far it sound, seems like most organizations are doing okay. Uh, we certainly have seen some changes in organizations uh, that are that are frightening to employees and creating a lot of anxiety as employees are concerned about how they're going to uh, manage their work and how they're going to work through some of the the uh, the concerns that they have around whether or not they're going to have work going forward. So as leaders, it's our responsibility to handle ourselves well through this pandemic, and we want to kind of try to find a place of centered and uh, be very grounded and centered through this time so that we can uh, project a sense of comfort 
for our employees. Um, they need to feel confident that we have a solid plan in place. And uh, if they do feel that way, chances are they're gonna be likely to, to respond in kind. Uh, and maintaining a sense of community at this time is really important. You know, just because we're socially distant doesn't mean we need to be distant. It means that we just can't physically stay in the same room together, but it doesn't mean that we can't connect in lots of different ways. And we'll share with you today some of the ideas that our clients are having and things that we're hearing about and learning about ways that um, employees do that today. So some of our goals in the human resources departments or the people uh, departments are really kind of to stay connected with employees as we talked about. Uh, by now we've seen most employers take a real strong uh, look at their policies and revisions um, and review them and making sure that they revise them, whether it's a temporary exception to a policy or whether they just look at their policy with a different set of eyes and, uh, and really try to think through uh, making adjustments if necessary. We're seeing new business continuity plans and, and um, being put into place. Safety is absolutely of the essence right now. Unfortunately, we've seen the first wrongful death lawsuit filed against Walmart um, this past week. And so, you know, I think it's going to be really important for us to have really strong safety in the workplace. And then to think carefully about what are, what's, what's next. I mean, we have a new normal right now. It's not gonna be the normal going forward. We're gonna see and hear different things going forward. This pandemic has likely irrevocably changed the way that we're going to be uh, conducting business in the United States and, and probably around the world in the future. So we'll talk a little bit more about each of those in just a moment. What I'd like to do now is talk just a little bit about the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, which was passed um, last month and took effect, originally was supposed to have taken effect on April the 2nd. And when the guidance came out about when to begin implementation, it actually backed up to April 1st, which most folks believe was because uh, it's the beginning of a quarter and the beginning of a month and just easier for businesses to enact that at that time. So the Families First Coronavirus Response Act has two, or FFCRA is what we are calling it for the most part, has two main provisions, the emergency sick leave pay and the FMLA expansion. And this uh, policy applies to, or this regulation applies to um, employers that have fewer than 500 employees. Um, the employees have to be employed for 30 days or more at the time of making a request. And they have to be verifiable um, the reason that they're going out has to be a verifiable reason. And so for an employee to use their emergency sick paid, uh, sick leave pay, uh, full-time and part-time employees uh, are eligible for up to two weeks of their pay um, at two-thirds of their pay with a maximum payout of $200 daily. I'm sorry, that's a full, I'm sorry, it's $511 a day uh, for that pay. Um, to a maximum of $5,110. And the difference between full-time and part-time is that with the part-timers, what we want to do is take a look at what their average pay has been, the average uh, number of hours that they worked or their average pay has been uh, during a period of time previously, and that's what we would be paying based on that. And so if an employee has children whose childcare has been closed, they may also be eligible for uh, additional pay under the FMLA expansion program, or sometimes we're hearing it called FMLA plus. Um, and so what that does is it expands the current FMLA policy that allows um, for coverage for employees who uh, have had their children's um, school or child care closed, uh, not school, child care closed because they are eligible uh, because of the coronavirus. Um, so employees who um, fall under this would, would be eligible for pay as well. The total amount of time that they can be out for that is 12 weeks. The first two weeks is unpaid, but again, there's a possibility that could be paid under the employee paid leave. And then um, the additional 10 weeks would be at 66.67% pay. So we can answer more questions about that uh, if we need to. What I'd like to do now is talk a little bit about the employee rights posting. So on March the 25th, the DOL published this poster. Uh, and this poster was, um, is available, as you can see, at these two uh, sites. We have it in for federal and for non-federal. And they've now put up also um, beginning to put them up in multiple languages. 
So if you go to the DOL, you can pull this poster down. This poster should be posted by April the 1st. It should have been posted by April the 1st and should, be and should remain posted through December the 31st of this year. Now, if employees are working in the office, we should post that notice uh, in the office with our other employment postings. If your employees are completely remote and virtual, we need to be moving uh, that to a different way to communicate uh, their rights under this act. So what we would do is either send that electronically or place it on your organization's intranet site. Um, and <clears throat> we recommend, Helios has always recommended that we, post, that we post in multiple locations. So making sure it's okay to send it out in email and also post it on the site and also post it in the office. Uh, we do wanna make sure that our employees understand what their rights are under the FFCRA. And one thing that uh, to consider as well is that employees who are hired now, especially employees who are hired virtually, this posting should be part of their new hire package uh, through the end of the year so that we can ensure that they're notified of their rights under this act. The other uh, act that's just recently come out last week, actually, uh, the end of last, uh, beginning of, or very beginning of last week, was a separate but related piece of legislation um, and it is called the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Securities Act. And what it does is um, primarily the majority of this uh, bill, it's an 880-page act carrying eight separate categories, many of which are tax credits and options for businesses. But the two we'll focus on today involve unemployment and uh, the payroll protection program. So those eight uh, areas there are on the right-hand side of the, of the slide as you look at it. Now, furloughed employees should definitely be encouraged to apply for unemployment um, because the Unemployment Act has certainly been expanded. As you may be aware, employees who are either furloughed or laid off due to um, the impact of the coronavirus are actually eligible for an additional $600 a week on top of whatever the state is offering them. So employees who are fur furloughed by either reducing their hours or by um, eliminating their employment, uh, their, their hours so that they're not coming to the office, they're not working, but they're still employees, um, that if they have file for unemployment, they may be um, eligible based, they may be eligible based on the calculations of that state for a certain portion of the unemployment. And then an additional $600 would go on top of that. So there's actually guidance that says that if there's even a $1 award of social security, of, I'm sorry, of unemployment, the additional $600 will go on top of that. So regardless of the amount that they're offered in the state, they're still eligible for the additional $600, as long as they get at least $1 and they are eligible. So it's important for us to think about that as we're looking at how to take care of and protect, protect our employees through this. Um, I've seen some employers actually make decisions about um, how they wanna move forward simply because of the amount of benefit that they would get uh, under unemployment process. So another thing to consider is the reducing of salaries, the reduction of salaries. So some organizations you know, are looking for ways, well, our organizations, most organizations are looking for ways to reduce cost and salaries can sometimes be taken into consideration there. So the Paycheck Protection Act, which is part of the CARES Act, provides loans to small businesses impacted by COVID-19 and some of the loan can be forgiven if certain conditions are met. One of the things that we don't wanna do is reduce people's salaries or reduce the head count. Um, and to get more information about that, the Small Business Administration website has links, um, and we have those links posted at the end of the webinar. They have links that you can go to to um, learn more about this act and how it works. Now, if you are considering reducing someone's employ uh, pay, they have to, let's say they're, and they're exempt, so they're salaried. We need to make sure that we maintain their exempt status, meaning that the work that we apply to them or that we assign them to do needs to also fall under work that would be considered exempt in any other time. So not only do we need to maintain that threshold of at least $648 a week, around $35,500 plus a little bit, we also need to make sure that they meet all of the other portions of the FLSA exemption testing um, so that we can maintain their classify, uh, maintain their classification as a salaried employer, employee. 
For our non-exempt employees, organizations must maintain federal, state, local, and government contracting minimum wages as well. Now, some states require notification prior to reducing a person's salary. For example, in Maryland, a full pay period of advance notice is required before reducing an employee's pay. So make sure that you check your state's labor law page for more information about any requirements that are necessary for pay reduction. Um, and in some of those states, if you're a multiple state employer um, and you have employees working across across the United States, uh, make sure that you're checking each of those websites for any regulations that may apply. Some of them require notification in a very specific way. Uh, reducing an employee's hours does not, um, it could have an impact on their eligibility for benefits, although we're seeing most carriers reducing or even eliminating the need to have hours worked um, for uh, eligibility for benefits. It's important for you to work with your broker and your carrier for classification for clarification on what your particular carrier uh, is doing in terms of eligibility for benefits. And the reduction of hours for a temporary status for non-exempt or exempt employees is not automatically a consideration for us uh, at this time for changing for their loss of status or their loss of coverage for benefits. So if you haven't already, here's a list of some of the policies that you should be reviewing. Certainly sick leave is a great place to start. We want to, whenever possible, look for ways to make it as easy as possible for employees to stay home when they're sick. So, uh, you know, not just the coronavirus is happening right now. We also still have our seasonal flu, flu epidemic. Um, our flu outbreak is going on right now. So it's important for us to make sure that we encourage our employees to stay home when they are not well, regardless of the reason that we're well. And certainly if it has to do with COVID-19, that we give them guidance on how to um, take care of themselves and protect both themselves and the organization during this time. So we've seen sick leave policies um, add things in, like if you have a cough, fever, cold, or upper respiratory illness symptoms, then please don't come to the office. Um, because you'll be sent home. And during a pandemic, it is allowable for you to send employees home if they appear to be exhibiting those symptoms. So you can ask them to leave. Um, you can direct them to leave the organization and uh, to seek medical assistance. Uh, certainly PTO policies are being uh, challenged right now in terms of how do we um, determine whether or not to ask someone to use PTO or whether or not to um, you know, to, to not have them do it. We cannot require people to use those policies during this time. So um, thinking carefully about how you want to um, encourage people to stay home is gonna be helpful at this time. And I think it's important too, to think about reminding employees that staying home right now is not only about not spreading the virus or not getting the virus as well. It's really also thinking about people who are immunosuppressed um, and that they may come into contact with and, and make, uh, for, for those people who are more susceptible to the, to the virus. Now, some companies today are sending their people, their employees home. Certainly a lot, most people are working remotely in this area in the DMV. Um, we see some people going into the office because of business operations. And so um, certainly um, the communicable disease or infectious disease policies are something we're starting to see pop up. They've always been out there uh, for some organizations, you know, this policy has been out there, but we're beginning to see it applied more and more to organizations now so that they feel more confident in being able to ask people to stay home if they need to. Uh, for the most part, we're not seeing hardly any business travel right now, as I'm sure you're not as well. And we have disaster recovery plans being put into place um, as a matter of, of operation right now. So reviewing those if they're already in place to make sure that you've covered any special considerations for security and other kinds of related things would be helpful. So as you're thinking about your sick leave policies or your PTO policies, here is a listing of some of the um, states and, and um, cities and counties that have specific regulations regarding mandated sick leave at this time. And so um, I'd like to tell you that this is all, in, all inclusive and I believe it is and uh, things are changing very quickly. So please do check your local areas and your local state employment labor law um, 
uh, sites to make sure that you have the most accurate information for your local area. Here in Virginia, you know, this is certainly correct and accurate here. Um, it's important for us, again, what we don't want to do is we want to make it as easy as possible for employees to be able to stay home. We don't want employees um, to have to make a difference between getting a paycheck uh, and exposing people to the virus. So making it as easy as possible is should be the name of the game here. And we're recommending to people that they be as flexible and as lenient with the policy as possible as well. I mean, everyone is, uh, many people are handling this in different ways. And so we want to make sure that we um, give people the option to handle it in a way to, to make the decision that's right for them and their families. So some of these regulations are coming into play as we're thinking about benefits and protections uh, under um, for regular situations and certainly some of these may come into play as well. So the ADA um, and its amendments certainly could potentially come into play, although this is considered to be a temporary disability. So for that, we'd be looking at something that was on the other end if someone didn't fully recover and, and developed a disability, um, either breathing related or otherwise on the other end of this. Certainly HIPAA needs to be considered. I'm sure you're all aware of HIPAA and HIPAA regulations. It's just important to remember at this time that employees, uh, managers and employees are gonna wanna know if somebody's um, not available, if they've got this virus. And it's your job, you certainly can notify employers, employees that someone is going to be out. You can certainly notify them if someone has been, if someone has contracted the virus. You cannot, however, tell them who it is. So it's really important to remember that an employee calls out um, we want to, we can verify that it is COVID related. However, we cannot confirm who the employee is as we're talking uh, about that. So if someone says, does Sally have COVID-19? We can't confirm that. We just would remind them that they're out today. Uh, short-term disability, we've seen all kinds of changes for short-term disability. Some employers are simply paying employees um, during this waiting, during the waiting period, or they're just paying employees as well. Um, and not requiring people to do, um, to use the reduced pay under the, um, under the FMLA or the paid sick leave, the emergency paid leave. Um, and so it's interesting to kind of watch how employers are choosing to be at least as generous as what the law is requiring, and then also um, adding a little additional assistance if they can. Uh, and finally, one of the things that uh, on here, there are several other areas we could be thinking about. One of the things that I really want to point out is employee assistance programs. So as our employees are really stressed and really showing a lot of anxiety around what's happening, it's important for us to remember the employee assistance programs. Uh, if your company doesn't have it, they're usually very inexpensive. In some cases, um, plans can be added on to, to uh, existing medical plans that are, so there's no cost. Um, if you don't have an employee assistance program with your organization, I, we'd recommend that you reach out to your carrier and have them uh, take a look at that and see if you can get that. It is a 100% uh, confidential, anonymous, actually it's confidential and anonymous. Um, the companies, companies, organizations don't get reports. They get a report about how many people have used the program, but they don't get a report saying, you know, Sally called in because she has um, XYZ problems. So, these uh, programs are open 365 days a year. They're, um, they have licensed counselors and therapists that can help employees work through some of the concerns that they have, as well as many other programs. And certainly during this situation, if you have someone who's really struggling, you may find an employee assistance program is helpful for you for them, for, and for them. So thinking about that, you know, how are your employees feeling? Um, so, so thinking about this pandemic, from a business perspective is certainly critical. It's also important to look at it from an employee's perspective because after all, they're, they're what make our organizations work. So keeping an employee-centric approach to handling this will make sure that our employees uh, know and believe that we have their best interests in mind as well as the organization. Uh, fear and anxiety right now, we certainly are hearing a lot from employees about concerns about 
things with uh, regard to their own personal health, their finances, whether their employment is going to be continued. And so people are really nervous about that. So uh, things like ta navigating telework for the first time or learning new technologies, um, all of those things can really create uh, some really uncomfortable situations for our, for our employees. So let's not forget that we're all human through this and we all um, are going through a lot. Um, you know, they're navigating things like elderly parents being at home or children being at home with them right now because schools are closed. And so there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of competing priorities right now with our employees. So we want to make sure that we are not allowing uh, fear to um, be really an option for them, that we want to give our, our employees as much confidence as we can about how our businesses are moving forward. And now is probably the best time to demonstrate your core values as it's going to have a lasting impact on your employees' morale and your engagement and your retention in the long term. So some of the things that we're seeing businesses do today, we're seeing alternating work schedules. Um, the federal government's doing quite a bit of this with their contractors. They're bringing employees in one week uh, on and one week off um, to let them work so that you're limiting the number of people uh, in the workspace uh, for positions that are mission essential. Uh, we're seeing remote, uh, we're, I think most of us are probably remote today, where remote and virtual working environments are happening across the country. Um, we were remote at Helios, <clears throat> I believe it was the day after the first case um, was a case broken in Virginia, was confirmed in Virginia. Um, and we did this to ensure that our employees were safe. And I know that many organizations followed quickly in line behind us to make sure that their employees were safe. Um, unlimited flexible hours. So um, we're seeing, you know, people, um, we're seeing people working all hours of the day and night because it what makes sense, it's what makes sense for them. Uh, we're seeing employees, um, maybe the maybe there's a, a two parent household and they have children so they're splitting the work day and working alternate work schedules themselves at home so that someone's watching and and educating the children and someone else is um, working and then they switch so we're seeing all kinds of really creative and interesting ways um, to impact uh, the home experience for employees Probably the, the thing to think about the most is that what we want to do in terms of cost cutting is trying to figure out ways that we can cost cut without impacting our employees as much as possible right now. <clears throat> so we're seeing things like hourly employees being who regularly receive overtime being cut down to um, just 40 hours a week. We're seeing um, all kinds of changes that can be made in the organization in terms of cost cutting uh, of before we get to that. Um, so we want to ask you, you know, as you're thinking about cost cutting, you want to evaluate your current staff and look at possibly reducing hours. Um, you want to look at your executive team to see if maybe there are bonus opportunities that be, could be cut or in, in all levels if there are bonus opportunities that could be cut. Um, certainly when the executive teams of organizations take the first hit, it gives employees a sense of um, comfort that they are being um, that they're trying to keep, that the employer is trying to keep them as whole as possible during this pandemic. Um, we've seen across the board salary reductions, as I mentioned, that one organization that I'm supporting did just a flat across the board salary reduction in the hopes that that would give them enough cost savings to be able to, um, to continue to operate. Um, certainly isn't the, the most um, popular decision. However, it does give a sense of team and it gives a sense of us being all in this together as an organization. Uh, furloughs, you know, wherever possible, there generally tend to be a win-win. <clears throat> a lot of great advantages to furloughs. Um, uh, certainly employees keep their job and they receive pay through unemployment. So again, if there's a reduction in their pay uh, at all, they may be eligible for unemployment. And if they lose if we reduce their entire employment at that time, then they're most likely are going to be eligible for unemployment. Um, and the good side is, of furloughs is that employees don't have to source new talent when the business improves. So once the business gets back to a positive way, then we can bring the employees back on and we don't have to go and look for new talent during that time. Uh, layoffs, layoffs are certainly happening. Um, the disadvantage of them is twofold. It's, it's a morale issue for employees obviously to be laid off from work. 
Um, and if they find other employment while they're laid off, chances are you're going to be looking for new talent when you come back. So um, certainly maybe a business requirement. We're seeing lots of organizations do phased approaches to, um, to that process. So how they're choosing to put together kind of a phased approach to how they're going to, to um, move people through the organization if they should have to make additional changes beyond what they've done so far. So they may start with, you know, a small hours reduction, or they may start with a small pay cut, and then they may look at furloughing some employees, and then they may look at laying off some employees. So we're seeing kind of a, um, a plan being put into place about how to, to move forward should we continue to need um, to make change going forward. So keeping your team together engaged at this time, again, it's so, so important to make employees, to help them to feel like they are part of something that's happening outside of their house. Um, so video Skype, uh, video conferencing websites, you know, we're on Zoom now and WebEx, Skype, Teams, Web, all of those types of things, as much as possible, getting people to use their cameras so that you feel a sense of being kind of together with someone. Um, using the phone, more than not, more often than not. So not just relying on IM or email, but also using the phone. You know, we lose quite a bit of our, um, of our, the hidden elements of the human interaction when we don't see each other in the communication. So body language is such a huge piece of it. So the ability to be able to get someone on a camera uh, not only helps us feel a part of something, but also helps us better interpret what's being said. Uh, regular check-ins and one-on-ones as much as possible, as consistently as you can, um, really helpful as well to help keep employees feeling like they're part of the team. Uh, we're seeing weekly video messages coming out from presidents and CEOs and other leaders of the organization to help them uh, help our employees understand what's happening with the organization and what considerations are at play, uh, what the process looks like going forward, and to just keep folks uh, connected. I know one of uh, actually my favorite ones that we've gotten from our CEO was one that she just talked about how about your own wellness, how to how, what she was doing for her own wellness um, and her own mental health to kind of keep herself connected. And um, I thought it was just a really neat kind of message to give that was other than you know doing just your job, but it was all about taking care of yourself as well. So giving us some great ideas on how to think about maintaining our own mental and uh, physical wellness during this time. And then of course, any kind of social media networking sites that we have, we're seeing companies play games. Uh, we are in a game right now at Helios called Living Orange. So it's uh, all about showing, putting up pictures of things that we're doing that's giving us energy to want to be excited to move forward. So those kinds of things, contests, photos, tips, um, an organization that I'm working with did a, hey, catch your dog doing the craziest pose while they're sleeping and posting on a picture. You know, anything that you can do with um, step challenges and, you know, exercises, activities and virtual happy hours and all kinds of ways to be creative and keep your employees connected and engaged right now is going to be really, really helpful to not only their productivity, but also their own personal mental and physical well-being. Performance is something that really, um, really gets a lot of conversation right now. So the reason for that is that we are in a situation right now where, you know, there are, we need to have reasonable expectations perform for performance. And so we want to kind of add to um, our thoughts around how we're talking to our employees about what we expect from them in terms of performance. And so looking at our goals, making sure that what we're asking our employees to do is really realistic for what the, for the situation that they may personally be in in their own environment. Um, you know, parameters around telework and flexibility, many times organizations will have pretty strong policies in place around those two um, areas. And what we may want to do is take a look at that and make a decision about whether or not what we have in place makes sense currently. So, you know, we talked a couple of minutes ago about, you know, flexible schedules, even in a home environment. So um, it may be more advantageous for you to consider what employees are accomplishing versus when they're accomplishing it. And I want to think about, you know, the employees in terms of what they've got going on at home. Again, you know, children and 
animals and uh, family members, uh, you know, school systems and um, ever, all the things that employees have going on at home right now, that employee centric approach is going to be so helpful to being able to make sure that you're properly motivating employees uh, in a place where they don't feel so in control of their own personal self. So some of the things to remember about is um, making sure that we're trying to help our employees structure their days around their families right now. It's so, so important to give them the flexibility to do that. Um, and think about your employees that are at home that maybe are um, by themselves. They may not have a support structure at home. So um, you, may, you wanna check in with those employees and make sure that they have what they need and that they're, that they're doing okay during these times. And above all, during these times right now, when we're looking at performance, you know, being calm and remaining really rational and understanding and patient through this time is going to be helpful um, to, to help our employees with the greatest amount of productivity. It's not really, um, it's not really probably a, a good uh, way for you to go to ask your employees to be as productive as they would be in a normal office setting. Um, so that expectation, you know, when we're talking about reasonable expectations there, that's what we're talking about, making sure that your expectations uh, are aligned to what they're capable of and that they understand what the expectations, if modified, are. So as you're thinking about business continuity, some of the things to think about is how other organizations are affected by your business. Um, so. Um, an example of this good year focused on having a plan in place to make sure that critical roles would be maintained in the event of a pandemic. Um, and each business unit and region was asked to identify critical roles. Next, the company organized, organized those roles by category, so essential and then temporary suspension and extended suspension roles that could be extended, that could be suspended without undue harm to the organization. And so they took a look at their talent bench and they determined if it would be necessary or difficult to backfill the essential roles and then created and made uh, adjustments as necessary to create that plan in place. Um, organizations are still hiring. Right now there's virtual onboarding going on, uh, virtual interviewing going on. Um, a lot more screening questions are happening in advance of those interviews and we're seeing an uptick in employee referrals and companies that are providing higher referral for referral bonuses for their employees even. Um, and as you may be aware in the state of Virginia, um, the unemployment, uh, the waiting period of one week was um, waived. So the governor waived the waiting period for unemployment for employees. So if they are, do find themselves in a position uh, to be unemployed, their um, unemployment benefits begin immediately. So let's take a look at some of the tips for creating balance for employees when they're remote working. Um, some of the things that we want to do is to help teach or coach our managers to be able to, to coach their employees. So thinking about things like identifying a workspace, um, making sure that there's a place that feels like their office setting, um, we want to make sure that they have a place that feels like where they're going to work, that they're working there, and when they're done at the end of the day, they're shutting off um, in that workspace and moving someplace else. Uh, I think it's important, too, to think here about teaching our managers. They need to take care of themselves first. So if we're on an airplane and the oxygen masks drop, the, the flight attendants tell us that we should take care of ourselves first before we help others. And that's the case here too. So we need to make sure our managers are also, as they're coaching employees, they also need to be doing the same. Um, having them create a schedule as whatever schedule that's gonna be that you can all agree upon and try to stick with it as much as possible. So, um, you know, as much as possible, trying to keep regular hours and trying to keep as much regular as they possibly can. What this does is helps to create a sense of control uh, in a place again where they may feel like they're not as in control and so it will help them create a new normal for their work day. We want to encourage our employees to take breaks, get up and go do something, um, you know, put on, um, put it on your calendar that you're going to do it, you know, I'm going to take a walk every day at lunchtime or I'm going to do this, but to get up from the desk, uh, it, certainly before the pandemic, it's always been known that people who work remotely tend to work more often uh, more hours at home uninterrupted. 
And so we want to encourage our employees to get up and to take breaks. And lastly, most importantly, is to teach our employees how to unplug. So again, with the anxiety that we have right now and the stress and the fear that we've got uh, running around with our employees, we want to teach them that it's okay for them to have their weekend or that it's okay for them to, you know, turn off, unplug at, you know, six o'clock and have dinner and then take care of their kids and then go back to, to work if they choose to afterwards. But we want to teach our employees that it's okay and reinforce with them that it's okay to have a break and to become, to be back, you know, to your human self. Um, and then also just lastly, encouraging employees, you know, when they are taking breaks and that they're unplugged to do things that matter to them. So whether that's decluttering or cleaning or spending time with their kids or exercising or doing yoga or meditation or walks, whatever makes them happy, whatever energizes them or re-energizes them so that they can keep as much consistency in their lives as possible. Now, a word I rarely say is the word need. When we're talking about unplugging, I think this is something we really need to teach our employees to do. We really need to focus on this. Um, they, they need to get a sense of the difference in work and home. Because when they're in the work environment, and the, which is the home environment, it's much more difficult to separate. So certainly uh, any opportunity that we have to help our employees with that, is going to work. Um, one of the things that is critical right now is um, emails. You know, if you're someone who likes to, uh, maybe you've decided that you're going to have an altered work schedule at home and you're sending out emails at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock and midnight uh, to your employees, that does not give them, unless you announce up front that you're going to be doing that and that there's no expectation. And frankly, even if you do announce it, many employees will feel a need or an obligation to respond when that happens. So it's important to really understand what you're dealing with with employees and, you know, consider using things like a delayed send option um, to send an email at eight, you know, so that it arrives in the employee's inbox at eight o'clock the next morning, rather than at midnight, uh, waking the employee up and, you know, making them feel obligated to get up and answer. So in other words, it's important for us as leaders to help them be responsible to themselves for unplugging and taking those breaks as needed. One of the things we also need to be considering right now, and there's that need word again, because it's going to be important, um, is really what is our new normal going to look like? Employees are going to come back to work at some point, we hope, and that um, to the offices, and that doing that is going to be really a challenge for them. So now our employees have been off anywhere from three to six weeks um, and they are creating their own new normal. And so what we're going to do at the end of that is saying, okay, now we're going back to the office. And so some things to start thinking about is how are the employees going to feel about that? Do they really want to come back to the office or have they gotten too accustomed to working at home and they kind of like this? Um, are you going to have any issues that you're going to have to um, combat or overcome at that time. Um, is there a part of your business that can remain remote uh, without damaging your brand? Certainly service, uh, customer service facing positions, maybe not so much, but you know, if an employee is really having a difficulty coming back, um, can their position remain remote? And what are employees gonna have to juggle when the change comes? And for me, this is the most critical question. If in each individual, if we, you know, say, okay, the, the um, stay-at-home orders have been lifted, and so now everybody's coming back to work on Monday. Well, not everyone may be able to come back right immediately. There may be other competing things that are happening for them at that time uh, that would make it very difficult. So each individual situation is going to be very different and personal, uh, and I don't, I don't think we're going to be able to expect to bring everybody back at the same time on the same day and have them be as productive as they were before this all happened. So looking at this from a leadership perspective and making sure that we are looking at this return to work um, from the employee's perspective and helping to figure out how to integrate them back into the workplace in the least productive way is going to be essential for us to get our businesses back to normal on the other end of our, um, of our stay at home orders. So what should we be doing right now? Well, we certainly want to be monitoring the current situation in our business and in the impact of the, the pandemic on our personal businesses. 
we want to be planning as much as we can for not only return to work, but also in the event that we're out longer than we had hoped we would be when we started um, these uh, stay at home orders, uh, that we have a plan in place for how we're going to navigate through that. That we continue business in this as much as possible, um, as consistently as possible, and in the same way as possible and every chance that we have, and that we also are communicating our plan to our employees and making sure that they have what they need to be successful, and that we provide ongoing resources. Um, you know, communicate, 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 that we have our employees really focusing on what's going to happen next for them and um, what's available to them and what we expect from them. So, um, you know, we've seen organizations do things um, you know, on a weekly basis where they're connecting employees to maybe some of these fun new um, apps that have come out, like um, uh, that we're seeing come across right now, you know, where people can get their brains working better or get their, you know, uh, play games online or doing things that will just kind of keep them focused on things other than the pandemic situation. So here is a laundry list of, uh, of websites that would be helpful right now to be looking at. You know, CDC, WHO, and the FDA are certainly talking about how the virus is, is spreading and what kinds of things we need to do in terms of safety uh, for our employees um, and uh, certainly um, looking at the cures and the vaccines. Uh, the FFCRA, which we've talked about, and the CARES Act, are those are the links to the um, questions Well, for the FFCRA. It's the, the very lengthy list of questions that came out to help, um, to help clarify some of the provisions in the FFCRA. Uh, you know, that bill came, both of those, both the FFCRA and the CARES Act came out so, so very quickly, um, and they're such large pieces of legislation that they certainly didn't take into account every situation, so there is guidance online at these two locations to help better understand how those um, bills work. Um, the, SS, the Small Business Administration has loans available and some guidance on how to manage through that. And then the IRS, um, this is about the tax credits and how to manage through the paid leave places. So, Kara, I think that is all I have to present, and I would love to um, know if there are questions that we'd like to talk Thank you, through. Kim. Can you hear me now? Oh, hold on. Oh. All right. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right, good. Okay, Kim, thank you very much. Um, we do have a few questions. Um, one that has come uh, via the chat feature from, uh, I believe her name is Mary, is for employees whose child care is closed, if they can work remotely from home, do they still qualify for the extended FMLA? So in general, no. And there's a possibility that possibility that they could. So um, it depends upon the specific situation. And Mary, you know, if you want to connect with me after, I'd love to talk with you a little bit more about the specific situation. But in general, the um, extended FMLA is for folks who, um, when the child care is closed and that employee is the caretaker that needs to be present, um, then they would qualify. So there's more to it than just... Um, I, I guess I need to know a little bit more about the specific situation to answer that question specifically. Okay. Um, here's another question I received. Um, uh, this is coming from, I guess, a manager's perspective. Uh, before this, my normal expectation was that employees would work a standard eight-hour workday during the traditional nine-to-five time frame. Yeah. With my employees working from home and many of them caring for children or elderly parents, is the typical eight hour workday even possible? I don't want my employees goofing off or taking advantage of me. So I don't wanna come out and say that I understand working only five to six hours a day under their current circumstance uh, is understandable, nor do I wanna tell employees that they have to make up the time during the weekend or take a pay cut. I wanna come across as caring and understanding, but at the same time, I want to convey that we have a business to run and jobs that must be done. How do I do this? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, it's all about really looking at what the expectations need to be for the position and, and making sure that you're well aligned with the employee. Again, I think there's probably a lot of employees who are working more than eight hour days. There are a lot who are working six or seven hour days and still accomplishing uh, what they need to accomplish. So unless the position is an hourly position where you're expected to work a specific number of hours in a day to accomplish things, I think it's really all about balancing and having just a real honest uh, conversation with the employee about what the expectations need to be. I do think the nine to five is probably a little bit tough right now. I think, you know, it's going to be difficult for us to maintain that at this point. Okay. Um, another question. Uh, I was set to give a performance review right before everyone started working from home. My initial plan was to wait until things got back to normal uh, so that I could conduct the review in person. Now I'm rethinking this decision. Should I conduct a, pers a virtual performance review? What are your thoughts? Uh, I would say, and I, and I would say this on behalf of Helios, we are recommending to organizations that they try to stay as as consistent with their business practices as possible. So while you wouldn't ordinarily though do a performance review over a virtual uh, channel unless the person is normally remote, I would say this is a time to say yes, absolutely. And doing that, you know, face to face with a camera is gonna be helpful and important too to make sure that you're um, doing that. I think people do need to know and do need that sense of feedback and they need to understand where they're standing kind of at work. So I think it's important to move that forward. Okay, great. Uh, another question, how do you keep employees focused during the current environment? Focused, <laughs> that's a great question. So, uh, you know, a lot of that depends upon the employee themselves and what, they're, what they are capable of managing at that time. I think the, the right amount of check-ins for that particular employee is gonna be helpful for some people that's for some people that may not be often, for some people that may be more frequent. Um, so checking in with people, making sure that they are um, that they are paying attention to what's expected of them. Uh, when I was in the military, I always loved the phrase, inspect what you expect. So if you expect them to be working on something, then take a look and make sure that they're working on that work and help them be responsible to do it. And also do it from a place of caring. So not not, you know, you need to get this done, but rather let me help you figure out how we can get you focused on this to get this done. Okay. Uh, could you uh, detail out maybe some of the creative things you've seen companies uh, that are doing right now to keep their teams working and collaborating together? Sure, yeah, we've seen, um, so I mentioned a few things. We've seen all kinds of uh, contests that are happening. We are seeing, um, you know, people are playing games. We've got uh, step step challenges happening and exercise programs happening. Uh, we're seeing all kinds of ways to uh, creative, just creative and fun things to do. Um, there was an organization that was, um, trying to remember um, exactly how they, exactly how they did it, but essentially what they were doing was trying to find, um, trying to find employees doing crazy stuff, like just, um, you know, like, I don't know, like making making food that they would normally learn, ordinarily make and just doing those kinds of things, cooking if they don't cook and, you know, shouting that stuff out. Today, I did this crazy thing, right? Today, I, you know, I did this thing that's maybe off of my, kind of outside of my comfort zone or off of my norm. So anything that we can do to shout out that, you know, it's a, it's a challenging time and we're all kind of doing different things to get through those. Okay. I know here at MVTC, we jokingly said that our next uh, staff meeting that we would hold via Zoom, we were going to do in costumes. Um, so I, I'm excited to see if this will actually play out on Monday. I will let everybody know. Maybe we'll snap a, snap some pictures um, if we do uh, um, <laughs> go into, into Halloween mode. Uh, I love it. You know, there's nothing wrong with gaming work. We would be, if we weren't uh, here right now, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we'd have been in the middle of March Madness. So we're used to playing games and contests at work. We just right. need to expand it away from you know, from, uh, from, from that. Okay, great. Um, let's see, we do have another question from um, Meredith. Um, if I have employees in the same department, one that has children at home and one who is single or kid free, how do I manage the workload fairly while still giving max flexibility 
per the need? So I think it's a matter of looking at those as individual situations, right? And applying what makes sense to that particular situation. So for example, I, I, I think, you know, having kids at home is really, I mean, my son is at home. And so I think having children at home is definitely something for our employees to learn to navigate. I don't think, however, that it gives them freedom to just say, well, I can't do as much work because my children are at home. So I think we have to kind of have that conversation and really talk through with the employee what the expectation of their position is going to be. Um, and then for these the folks who are single, you know, we may find that same conversation or we may go the other way. Hey, just because you don't have these other things that are competing, we don't expect you to, you know, work crazy hours. So it's really looking at those as individual situations and solving them individually. As, as, as it makes sense for that employee. Okay, and then uh, we have a comment here from Kathy. She says that she has also seen many leaders being intentional about reaching out to people and their employees, their customers, and having quick individual video chats. Uh, do you agree that that's a, a good idea? Yeah, I agree to it, uh, and I agree that it is, and I, and I actually think it's neat, and I think it doesn't need to just happen at, you know, at management levels. I think it's fun for employees to do that. I think it's fun for, you know, at every level of the organization, maybe you're reaching out to somebody that you don't normally talk to and just say, hey, I haven't talked to you for a long time. And, you know, let's spend two minutes on or three minutes or five minutes on this and, you know, find some time. I do think there is a time right now for us to pay attention to, to other people's schedules. So rather than just pinging somebody, maybe we say, hey, I want to have some time with you. I'd love to schedule some time with you and actually schedule it so that people can manage their own schedule. Um, maybe a little bit more control there than they would normally have in a work setting. Yes, I, I definitely agree with uh, yeah. scheduling something with a, a little guy running around. Um, yes, I need to <laughs> plan the TV time appropriately uh, to, uh, to schedule meetings like that. Um, I think that is all the questions we have today. Thank you so much, Kim, for you, your time. Do you have any um, parting thoughts? Yeah, I think, you know, as we look at employees and we look at just general workflow, employees tend to work harder at the beginning of the week than at the end of the week. So I think if you have really more challenging things that need to be done and you want employees to work on those things, I think you schedule that more toward the beginning of the week. And that gives them more at the end of the week to kind of wrap things up and feel closed off. I think that also helps with um, giving them the ability to unplug a little bit more toward the end of the week. So really think about as you're working with employees, how you're going to balance out um, their, what they're doing, you know, the work that they're doing in their week, let, you know, assign the tough stuff at the beginning of the week so that they can get that done and get that off their plate and move on to things that are maybe not as challenging. Okay, great. Thank yeah. you very much. Welcome. Well, I would like to thank everyone for joining us on today's webinar. We look forward to seeing you at future events. Remember, you can view a complete list of our events on our website at www.nvtc.org. I'd like everyone to have a great day. Stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you very much.